And the session now continues with uh, Gordon Melton, who is another uh, well-known scholar in the field of religion, distinguished professor of American religious history at uh, Baylor University in uh, Waco, Texas. Uh, and he will uh, uh, trace the interesting history of opposition to Jehovah's Witnesses in the United States. So, Professor Melton, the floor is yours. The Jehovah's Witness communion has emerged in the 21st century as one of the most important religious groups globally. It is one of the very few religious denominations in the United States to have a worshiping community in as many as 200 countries of the 240 recognized by the UN. Meanwhile, in the US, the land of its birth and home to several thousand religious denominations, it is one of but 25 denominations to attract at least a million adherents. Its numerical success has not come without controversy indeed. The Jehovah's Witnesses have a unique history of overcoming per public disparagement of its beliefs and practices. What we know today is Jehovah's Witnesses emerged in stages through the 1870s in the United States, beginning with an independent Bible study group in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, organized by Charles Taz Russell in 1870. Russell, who had been influenced by the Adventist tradition, was concerned with eschatological questions and believed he had solved a critical problem about the return of Jesus Christ with a redefinition of the Greek word parousia. Rather than return, he suggested that that uh, Greek term meant presence. Uh, following that key change, he suggested that Jesus' parousia, or presence, was in 1874. A generation in 1914 would see the end of this present age. To further his views, Russell began issuing a periodical, The Watchtower, in 1879. He incorporated the Watchtower Society in 84, and then moved his headquarters from Pittsburgh to Brooklyn in 1909. During this period, he also issued a six-volume set of books called Studies in the Scripture that presented his broad perspective announcing the millennial dawn, the arrival of a new age of the coming kingdom. And he organized an army of associates to spread out across the country and distribute his writings to eager believers. Russell died in 1916, by which time he led a movement with centers across North America and was already spreading around the world. Russell died shortly after World War I began amid speculation that the war was a sign of the end of this present social order, but before the United States had formally entered the war, which it did in 1917. Shortly after its entrance into the war, the government passed the Espionage Act, which targeted anyone in the United States who might interfere with military operation or the recruitment of soldiers or provide support for the country's enemies. This act immediately called into question any religious group with pacifist tendencies, such as the Mennonites or the Quakers, and especially those groups that had formed relatively recently, such as the Church of God in Christ, an African-American Pentecostal group whose founder, C.H. Mason, was arrested on two occasions for advising his young members to refuse the draft. Meanwhile, Russell would be followed by J.F. Rutherford as the new head of the Watchtower Corporation. The legitimacy of his leadership was challenged by several and led to the first schisms among the Watchtower Bible students, especially after Rutherford led in the publishing of a seventh volume of studies in the scripture. However, he emerged with the overwhelming support of the following and went on to direct the society for the next three decades. He is remembered today for leading the society to adopt its present name, Jehovah's Witnesses, in 1931. 
Rutherford died in 1942 and was succeeded by Nathan Homer Noel, who would remain in charge for the next quarter of a century. Among the more noticeable changes introduced by Noor was the removal of any author's name from the Jehovah's Witnesses literature. Russell had published a stream of books, but beginning in the 1940s, uh, Watchtower Books no longer carried the name of anyone who contributed to its writing. Noor also instituted a new leadership training program that raised the level of interaction of the Watchtower people with possible recruits and led to a significant expansion of the size of the witness community, both nationally and internationally. Nor also oversaw the Watchtower response to the controversy that surrounded it and led it through its most intense phase. It was during the height of Russell's career at the end of the 19th century that leaders within mainstream Protestant denominations, still in a growth phase, recognized that it had a variety of competitors who denied what was considered the essential core of Christian doctrine. Inside the church were the modernists and on the fringe were a growing number of new religions, the cults, the term cult being introduced by a Protestant minister in the 1890s and be becoming very popular in the 1920s. Relative to the Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian critics accused it of a variety of doctrinal errors, beginning with the Arian theology espoused in the studies in the scripture. The fourth century Bishop Arius essentially denied the divinity of Jesus, suggesting that Jesus was God's firstborn, but slightly less than God himself. That slight change in Jesus's status then reverberated through the Christian theology relative to, for example, the nature of Jesus's role in human salvation. The rise of a Christian counter-cult movement paralleled the rise of fundamentalism, and counter-cultists always included the witnesses among their targets. It received a lengthy chapter in Jean Van Balen's Chaos of the Cults in the 1930s and Walter Martin's successive volume, The Kingdom of the Cults in the 1960s and was prominent as one of the four major cults cited by Anthony Hakima in 1963. For the last half of the 20th century, it vied with the Latter-day Saints as the major target of counter-cult accusations. Major accusations against the witnesses included their denial of the full divinity of Jesus, their denial of the traditional doctrine of hell, and the obvious failure of their predictions about the end of the present social order. When the Watchtower introduced their own translation of scripture, the New World Translation, beginning in 1950, it was given extensive scrutiny and denounced as a flawed translation. The countercultists also gave particular attention to apostate story. The autobiography of William Snell, 30 Years a Watchtower Slave, initially released in 1956, became an essential item at every counter-cultist library. It has remained in print into the new century to the present. As apologetics has developed as a significant field in evangelical seminaries, new anti-Jehovah Witness material is continually being generated, uh, including a whole new set of apostate materials. This overview of uh, Jehovah Witness history defines an environment in which the witnesses encountered government and legal forces through the 20th century. The initial problem emerged just as they were reorganizing following Russell's death in 1916. The United States formally entered World War I in April of 1917. Two months later, the legislature passed the Espionage Act, which made it a crime among other things to refuse duty in the armed services and to obstruct the country's recruiting of uh, our enlistment of service. Conviction led to fines up to $10,000 and imprisonment up to 20 years. It was passed by a narrow margin as the legislatures were quite aware of the unpopularity of the war among the general population. The President Wilson administration had been reelected on the slogan, he kept us out of war. 
While initial targets of the act were the socialist wing of the labor movement, less than a year after the act's passage, the government moved against the Bible student. In May 1918, sedition charges were laid under provisions of the Espionage Act against Rutherford and seven of the Watchtower directors and officers, citing as their rationale some statements from the Finnish Mystery, that last seventh volume of the Studies in Scripture series that had been published the year before. Particular statements used against the uh, Bible students grew out of the general separatist position expressed in the Watchtower's pacifist stance. Rutherford and his colleagues were subsequently charged on four counts, were arrested, and tried. On June 21st, the seventh de seven defendants were sentenced to four 20-year terms, the sentences to run concurrent. The war ended in 1918, and shortly thereafter, the prisoners' cause gained some traction. Nine months into their sentence, Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis ordered their release on bail. They had served nine months in the federal penitent penitentiary in Atlanta before being released. In April 1918, an appeals court ruled that they had been denied an impartial trial and reversed their conviction. A year later, the government announced that all charges had been dropped and that there would be no further attempt to retry them. The matter seemed closed. But in the post-war years, the movement to display the flag and to wed that display to a newly written Pledge of Allegiance began to gain ground in the country. Churches had become involved, especially in the Midwest, where many German and Scandinavian churches, which had previously maintained worship in their home country's language, quickly anglicized during the war years and placed an American flag prominently in the sanctuaries where they held Sunday worship. After the war, especially after the adoption of the present text of the allegiance in the 1920s, the placement of a flag, Pledge of Allegiance, and the lay form of a salute to the flag all began to make their way into the public schools. In, in the 1930s, even as the witness gained a new level of visibility by adopting their distinctive name and beginning to, uh, to build kingdom halls, the insertion of a pledge into the public schools morning exercise led to the witnesses reiterating their belief that some expressions of patriotism were nothing more than idolatry, and their members should avoid them. As World War II began, and especially in the years prior to the United States officially entering the war in the wake of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the issue of the children and youth of JW families refusing to salute the flag and say the Pledge of Allegiance would become a significant public issue. The issue was assigned an increasing importance after Congress formally adopted Pledge in 1942, and then the following year designated a standard form for the average citizen who was not a member of the armed services to respond or salute the flag. JWs refused to salute the flag or repeat the pledge. Practices that had their greatest impact on their children who were attending public schools, where they faced both the ire of teachers and the taunts of classmates. A new phase in the opposition of the witnesses to activities around the flag began in the summer of 1935 when Rutherford told a JW convention that to salute an earthly emblem was unfaithfulness to God and that he would not do it. As school started up, one Carlton Nichols, third grade pupil brought up in a Jehovah Witness family, refused to recite the pledge and was duly expelled from his school in Lynn, Massachusetts. As the incident received press coverage, other witness children followed suit and Rutherford publicly praised them. He wrote a book called Loyalty, discussing the issue, which had the effect of transforming his personal opinion concerning the flag into the official teachings and accepted doctrine of the Jehovah Witness organization. Some witnesses even went so far as to form private schools in order to avoid the 
problems created in the public schools. Several years later in Minersville, Pennsylvania, a pro predominantly Roman Catholic community, a man named Walter Gobitas decided to challenge the system by instructing his children to refuse to say the Pledge of, of Allegiance. Gobitas was a regent, recent convert to the witnesses. He was inspired by stories of others who had challenged the system and suffered for it. He decided to make a stand himself and instructed his children not to pledge allegiance when at school. His son and his son's siblings were expelled. His business was boycotted. The situation led to a trial in February of 1938. And in June, a judge ruled that Minersville School Board requirements that the children salute the flag violated the children's free exercise of religious belief. In other words, he had won his court case, but the school board uh, appealed the case. The case finally landed on the desk of the Supreme Court in 1940. In the case of the Minersville School District versus Gobitus, the court ruled eight to one to reverse the lower courts and uphold the mandatory flag salute. The ruling led to a public backlash against the witnesses. People were physically assaulted. Kingdom halls were burned. The American Civil Liberties Union reported to the Justice Department that nearly 1,500 witnesses had been physically attacked in more than 300 communities nationwide. At the time, the U.S. was publicly debating the country's entrance into World War II, and many interpreted the decisions by the court against the witnesses by suggesting that the witnesses were traitors to the country. In 1942, still before the U.S. formally entered the war, West Virginia's Board of Education ordered the public schools to make the salute to the flag a regular part of the daily program of their school activities and added that any refusal to salute the flag would be regarded as an act of insubordination. It should be noted that the salute at this time was a raised right arm that looked strangely similar to the Hitler salute in Nazi Germany. It was also to be done while repeating the Pledge of Allegiance. At this point, Marie and Gaffey Barnett, children of a witness family in Charleston, West Virginia, refused to salute the flag. They were duly expelled and their parents filed suit against the school board. They actually won the case when first heard locally, but it was appealed upward and landed again at the Supreme Court. The witness's lawyer, Hayden Covington, who would, by the way, take a number of the cases to the Supreme Court over the next decade, argued for the court to overturn its previous decision, an argument that had gained broad support, including that of the American Bar Association. And the court listened. Reversing the Pennsylvania ruling, it concluded in a 6-3 decision that it was unconstitutional for public schools to compel students to salute the flag. It added that any attempt to establish a compulsory unification of opinion was both doomed to failure and antithetical to the values set forth in the First Amendment. Parallel to the flag cases were a set of cases involving the witnesses' aggressive program of evangelization. Witnesses were active in the streets and in knocking on the doors of private homes to present their case religiously. They passed out literature and solicited donations. They also carried a, a phonograph machine to play records presenting their teachings. Some of this material was blatantly hostile to the other religions in general but to the Roman Catholic Church in particular. It should be noted, however, that whilst the Roman Catholic Church was the largest church in the United States and had been the, such for 100 years, the Protestant churches were collectively much larger, even though they shared the anti-Catholic views of the witnesses. While the content of the material distributed by the witnesses was in some context at issue, the manner in which they distributed was more often the legal concern with which they had to deal. 
Beginning in the late 1930s, cases on literature distribution and related issues began to arise. The most critical one being a predominantly Roman Catholic neighborhood in New Haven, Connecticut, in which a witness named Newton Cantwell, along with his two sons, carried out their proselytizing ministry. They were arrested for not having attained a certificate to solicit funds in public and for breaking the peace. Initially, the state Supreme Court ruled against the Cantwells, but in a unanimous ruling, the United States Supreme Court ruled against the state in that requiring what amounted to a license to exercise religion violated the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. Crucial to the issuing of such a document was allowing an individual official the authority to determine which groups should or should not receive one. Cantwell versus Connecticut also had the effect of clarifying an understanding in American law. The First Amendment guarantees freedom of religion uh, at the federal level, but also now at the state level. Not only was the federal government forbidden to pass laws abridging the exercise of religion, but neither could the states do it in the same manner. It should be noted that uh, the Cantwell decision had an interesting effect uh, in the 1970s. The Unification Church uh, had a number of cases for it, relative to its solicitation on the street, actually somewhere close to a thousand cases, all of which they won based upon the ruling in the Cantwell case. Final set of court cases for the witnesses, uh, however, would arise in the 1990s. They involved a peculiar belief of the witnesses relative to drinking blood. Based upon biblical admonitions not to drink blood, 1 Samuel 14, 33, for one, the witnesses refused blood transfusions. This belief, while considered by many to be ignorant or superstitious, by most Christians to be based on an extremely odd uh, exposition of scripture it was a strong belief held by the witnesses and still is held. In the United States, individuals, adults, may refuse any medical procedure. So for them, the issue of drinking blood and receiving transfusion was a medical issue, not a legal one. It became a legal one when it involved a minor. The primary issue involving blood transfusions concerned minors who might need an operation that included a blood transfusion as an essential part of it. This situation was kept out of uh, legal proceedings by a simple procedure in which prior to uh, a scheduled operation, Doctors would simply ask the court to assume parental authority for 48 hours, allow the procedure to continue, and then return parental authority to the physical parents. These how, uh, cases, however, assumed a radically new perspective in the 1990s, when America faced a dramatic blood shortage due to the contamination of the blood supply in the AIDS, with the AIDS virus. Through the 1970s and 80s, due to their belief, the witnesses had led in the development of various alternative surgical procedures that did not require transfusions. These alternative procedures became quite popular in the 1990s and have subsequently more permanent changes in surgical practices in the post-AIDS era. Concluding. Through the middle and late 20th century, the witnesses championed a set of unpopular beliefs and practiced several very unpopular behaviors, which led initially to a community reaction and then caused the witnesses to challenge a set of laws, which at the state and local levels attempted to push back against those very beliefs and practices they held so dear. In order to practice their religion, the witnesses at first fell victim to the laws, and then mounted a national effort to have the laws changed and removed. 
Their efforts resulted in more than 20 cases that went to the Supreme Court, almost all of which they won. In winning them, in effect, they rewrote American law and expanded our understanding of the implications of the First Amendment to the Constitution by extending the impact of the Bill of Rights and of its guarantees of the freedoms of the exercise of religion, speech, and assembly. Thank you.